Welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at the maternal changes that occur in pregnancy. Specifically, we're going to start by looking at the cardiovascular changes, then the respiratory changes, the renal changes, gastrointestinal changes, and then the hematological changes that we can expect to see in the pregnant patient. I've added timestamps to this video so you can skip along as needed. We'll start by looking at the cardiovascular changes we can expect during pregnancy. One of the largest of these changes is we see a 30 to 50% increase in cardiac output, with this increase peaking by the third trimester. This increase in cardiac output is going to be related to increasing estrogen levels, which we're going to see continually rise into the third trimester. We'll bring the kidney into the diagram to further explore how estrogen plays a role here. What estrogen does is binds or stimulates the kidney to reabsorb fluid into the vascular space. So as estrogen binds, we see fluid reabsorption into this vascular space. As we see increasing amounts of fluid being reabsorbed, we're going to have an increase in the amount of blood that's returning to the heart, or we're going to see an increase in preload, which will have a dramatic effect on the heart's ability to stretch. In order to illustrate this more clearly, we'll break it down into a flow chart. So, as we mentioned, one of the first things we're going to see is this increase in estrogen. Following the increase in estrogen, we're going to see an increase in renal fluid reabsorption, which will ultimately result in an increase in total body volume. This increase in fluid volume will ultimately result in an increase in preload, or the amount of blood that is returning to the right atria and right ventricle. This increase in preload will increase stretch of that ventricle, so as more blood enters the right ventricle, it will stretch further, which will allow for an increase in stroke volume, followed by an increase in cardiac output. So we'll actually see a 30 to 50% increase in cardiac output due to the increased amount of blood that's returning to the heart. We'll shift this flowchart over to the side so that we can talk about the next cardiovascular change we'll see in pregnancy. And this change is an increase in heart rate. The degree of heart rate increase we see in pregnancy will vary depending on the patient. However, it's likely that this increase will not exceed 100 beats per minute. What's interesting about these changes is that despite having an increase in cardiac output and an increase in heart rate, we actually see a decrease in blood pressure. And this decrease in blood pressure is mediated by progesterone. Progesterone stimulates the smooth muscle of the vascular tissue to dilate, resulting in a 20% decrease in our systemic vascular resistance. So with this 20% decrease in our systemic vascular resistance, we actually see a corresponding decrease in blood pressure as well. We recognize these changes as a 10 to 15 millimeter mercury decrease in blood pressure within the first trimester. And because of the increasing cardiac output as, and as well as the increasing heart rate, we generally see the blood pressure returning to normal in the second trimester. We'll shift some of this information to the side in order to talk about the effects of uterine growth on venous return. At approximately 20 weeks gestation, the uterus has grown significantly and we can begin to see compression of the venous vasculature. There are two main consequences of this, the first being the decrease in preload while the patient is right lateral. As the uterus is large enough at 20 weeks, when the patient is positioned right lateral, the uterus will compress the inferior vena cava and decrease the amount of blood that's returning to the heart. The second consequence that we see due to this compression is an increase in varicose veins and peripheral swelling. As the inferior vena cava is compressed, we see a decrease ability of blood to return from the peripheral veins and we see an increase in hydrostatic pressure behind that compression. Next, I'd like to speak to some of the normal signs and symptoms that we can expect to see as a result of these changes. Signs and symptoms such as palpitations, lightheadedness, dizziness, exercise intolerance, and syncope are related to this decrease in blood pressure and increase in heart rate associated with pregnancy. Symptoms such as varicose veins and peripheral edema are related to the fact that there's an increase in circulating blood volume and the potential for compression of the venous system. Finally, pregnant patients are at risk of anemia because we see an increase in circulating plasma and increase in plasma volume without an associated increase in red blood cells. As a result, the patient may be anemic, which can exacerbate some of the symptoms we mentioned above. Next, I'd like to talk to the respiratory changes that we can expect to see in the maternal patient. The most significant of these changes is we see a 40% increase in tidal volume by the end of the first trimester. This increase can be associated to two different causes, the first being an increase in oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. As we can see here, oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged over the alveolar membrane. In pregnancy, this exchange is exacerbated by this increase in oxygen use and CO2 production. By the end of the third trimester, this increases up by about 20 to 30%, but we can actually see it exceed 100% during labor.
The second cause of this increase in minute volume is the effects of progesterone on the brain stem. As pregnancy progresses, progesterone levels rise, and they are going to continuously stimulate the brain stem to increase both the rate and depth of respirations. As a result, we see a significant increase in the minute volume. In addition to this increase in oxygen consumption and production and the stimulation of the brainstem by progesterone, we also see the growing uterus compressing the diaphragm and putting pressure on the lungs. As a result of this pressure, we're going to see compression of the alveoli. We can actually see some atelectasis of that tissue. The consequence of this is that we start to see a decrease in our functional residual capacity, or basically the reservoirs or stores of oxygen that people are gonna use in times of compensation. One of the consequences of these changes is that pregnant patients are often in a state of chronic mild respiratory alkalosis with metabolic compensation. We can visualize this consequence through the use of a flowchart. And the first stage of this flowchart is we see this increase in progesterone and increase in CO2 production, which is going to increase our minute volume. Following this increase in minute volume will be an increase in CO2 exhalation, which is going to decrease the amount of CO2 within the blood. In response to these following levels of CO2, the body will use carbonic anhydrase to convert hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions into water and CO2. This will subsequently shift the bicarbonate buffer system to the left, which means that we'll see a decrease in hydrogen ions and an increase in pH. As the pH rises and the blood becomes alkalotic, the renal system will begin excreting bicarbonate as a form of metabolic compensation. So as we can see here, the increase in minute volume and reduction of CO2 within the blood results in this leftward shift of bicarbonate buffer system and this increase in pH, which is ultimately going to cause a respiratory alkalosis. In response to this, we have the renal system excreting bicarbonate, which will be the metabolic compensation. This alkalosis can be further visualized using the bicarbonate buffer system equation, in which we see the leftward shift, which means we have an excess of CO2 being exhaled, and we have a reduction in hydrogen ion concentration. Another consequence to the changes we mentioned is the decrease in functional residual capacity, and this is due to the atelectasis from the compression of the diaphragm. As functional residual capacity plays a large role in compensation, we start to see a decreased ability to compensate during times of exercise or respiratory illness. Finally, due to an already increased minute volume, some respiratory alkalosis, and a decreased functional residual capacity, we see an increased potential for the exacerbation of respiratory illnesses. And I'd like to shift our attention to the renal changes that we can see in the pregnant patient. As in most of these other systems, the renal changes are going to be mediated by the effects of progesterone. So we see this increased amount of progesterone. And in order to impact the renal system, what happens is we see an increase in vasodilation. This increase in vasodilation subsequently increases our glomerular filtration rate, or our GFR, which are going to have a number of impacts on our kidney. We can take a look at this by showing the effect of progesterone on the afferent arterial. So as progesterone acts on the kidney, we start to see dilation of the afferent arterial, which is going to increase the amount of blood that can flow to the glomerulus. As a result of this increased blood flow to the glomerulus, we start to see an increase in our glomerular filtration rate, which can have a number of consequences in terms of the renal system. In order to more specifically increase this increase in GFR, we can actually correct our flowchart to say that we have an increase in vasodilation of the afferent arterial, which is gonna allow for more blood supply or more blood flow into the glomerulus. As we have this increase in blood flow to the glomerulus, we end up seeing this further increase in glomerular filtration rate. One of the key consequences of this increase in GFR is an increase in urine production, and this is one of the reasons why we see an increase in urination in the pregnant patient. Intuitively, if we have an increase in urination, we're also having an increase in urine production. One of the consequences of this is we see an increase in volume of fluid within the nephron and the ureter. And in these cases, we start to see this increased fluid increasing the amount of hydrostatic pressure it's exerting, which leads to this hydronephrosis and this hydroureter. So we see an increase in size of the ureter and the nephron or the kidney itself. Progesterone also impacts the ability of the ureter to have motility. So as we start to see an increase in progesterone concentration, we start to see a decrease in ureter motility. And the result of this decrease in ureter motility means we have an increased chance of stagnation of urine, which allows for greater opportunity for bacterial colonization. As a result of this bacterial colonization, patients can be at increased risk of things like urinary tract infection, nephritis, and bladder infection. Finally, as urination is increased, we start to see an increased excretion of things like glucose, proteins, and albumin. Next, we'll take a look at the gastrointestinal system, and we'll use a flowchart here as well to look at the effects of progesterone. 
In the GI system, increasing progesterone leads to a decrease in smooth muscle tone, which can lead to a decrease in GI motility as well as decreased closure of the lower esophageal sphincter. As a result, we start to see increased gastric pressure, or we start to have an increased chance of gastric juices being pushed back up through the GI system. When we don't have closure, we have decreased closure of this lower esophageal sphincter, what happens is it allows for these gastric juices to actually be pushed back up into the upper GI, GI system and irritate the stomach or the lining of the esophagus. As a result, it's this decrease in smooth muscle tone that often leads to GERD or constipation that's seen in pregnancy. Unfortunately, this constipation and increased venous pressure actually puts pregnant patients at increased risk of hemorrhoids as well. Increasing progesterone also has an impact on the gallbladder's ability to eject bile. Gallbladder uses motility or uses a squeezing motion in order to eject bile into the common bile duct which travels through the pancreas and into the small intestine. When we have this decrease in motility, fluid can become stagnant within the gallbladder. The problem with this is that we also have an increase in estrogen in pregnancy, which is made up of cholesterol, which is a primary ingredient in gallstones. As a result, what can happen is these gallstones will block the common bile duct combined with the decreased motility. We see cholestasis or the inability of the gallbladder to push bile forward. This can lead to irritation of the gallbladder lining or infection with bacteria as that fluid remains stagnant within the gallbladder. Finally, I'd like to take a look at some of the hematological effects of pregnancy. One of the main things that we see is a 40 to 50% increase in plasma volume. So our plasma volume expands, like we mentioned in the cardiovascular piece, uh, with not a ton of associated increase in red blood cells. So we have our normal plasma here, and we see that expansion of 40 to 50% of our total plasma volume in pregnancy. Next, associated with this increase in plasma, we generally see a 20 to 30% increase in red blood cell production. But as you can see, these numbers don't match. We have a much smaller increase in red blood cell production than we do have an increase in plasma, which can lead to this mismatch or anemia that we may see. So if this is our normal amount of red blood cells, we only see a small increase in red blood cell production, which can ultimately result in anemia within pregnancy. Another important hematological change we see in pregnancy is an increase in hypercoagulability. This increase in hypercoagulability is mediated by a number of factors. First being an increase in procoagulation factors, second being an increase in platelet aggregation, and third being an increased potential of stasis of blood. In terms of procoagulation factors, we see an increase in fibrinogen, von Willebrand factor, and factors 7, 8, and 10. We also may see an increase in thromboxin, and with this compression on the vasculature and stagnation of blood, this puts the vasculature at increased risk of platelet aggregation and clot formation. Due to this increased potential for clot formation, these patients are at risk of potentially deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. 